All right, everyone, welcome. We're a couple minutes after the hour, and so we will get started. I'm sure a few more people will filter in, but welcome to the August Paradigm webinar. I'm Morgan Young, NIA's Director of Communication and Outreach, and I'm delighted to welcome our guest today, Dr. Tara Barnhart. Dr. Barnhart is a consulting veterinarian for beef cattle feedlots in Southwest Kansas. She graduated with a degree in veterinary medicine from Kansas State University and is a member of NIAA's Advanced Training for Animal Agriculture Leaders Program. In June, she gained notoriety by using her voice to advocate for our industry during one of the most devastating weather events affecting animal ag in recent history. Today, Tara will share lessons learned and thoughts on how our industry can tackle difficult conversations in the future. Please welcome Dr. Barnhart. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. And we were just joking before everyone came on that I overscheduled myself like veterinarians often do. And I'm shocked I'm not giving this while sitting in my vet truck at a feed yard. I did borrow an office from a feed yard, um, but I am not sitting in my truck, which should allow for the audio to be a little bit better. I wanted to give a little bit of background to our um, weather event that Morgan talked about in my intro, um, just in case some of you on the call aren't as familiar with what, what happened in Kansas or, or some of the timeline of events, just to give you a brief overview. And if anybody has questions or wants me to go in more depth of that, um, I kind of came with the assumption that that many of the listeners would, would have maybe heard about it or had most of the gist. So on June 10th of this year, I gave birth to my third summer baby. As a veterinarian, you'd think I'd know a little bit better um, than to summer calf, but uh, I'm a cow vet and I decided against a lot of my own recommendations and had a little boy on June 10th. And on June 11th, I remember being in the hospital um, previous to that day, June had been very, very mild for our area. The weather was very cool. The nights were getting down um, below 40 degrees, and that is very odd for Southwest Kansas. Um, and, you know, we were having 60, 70 degree days. And so prior um, to my son's birth, we had a really, really nice June. It was very, uh, very tolerable for a uh, end of term pregnancy. And then we had an event of much needed rain. Um, we had gone over 200 days without measurable precipitation in many of the areas that I practice in Southwest Kansas. And so it was very dry prior to that week and we had received um, about three inches of rain that week. And so on June 11th, um, the temperature started to climb and it was 105 degrees and climbing. Um, and I thought, I remember thinking to myself in the hospital, what a great day not to be a cow vet and be pregnant. Um, and so I thought that when I was in the AC um, of the hospital and I kind of started paying attention to the weather and getting a little bit more nervous about um, what, what was coming. Um, the temperatures got above 105 degrees. The humidity, which we are usually a very arid climate, we don't have humidity. Um, it was upwards of 40% humidity, which for our area is, is pretty high. And then the, the thing that is the most devastating part is the wind dropped. Um, it was less than seven miles per hour wind. And I just remember standing in the hospital and looking out into the parking lot. And there is a flag that flies the American and Kansas flag, a flagpole that flies both of those flags. And there was no movement in either of those flags. They just stood still. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I hope the wind kicks up tonight because otherwise we're in a lot of trouble. And this kind of, um, weather event is no different than a blizzard. A lot of uh, people after this event wondered, how did you not see this coming? Or how did you, you know, not plan for this? Um, it's no different than a blizzard. It's no different than a tornado. We, we have clues that this could happen. We have 
a lot of forecasting that that thinks that this might occur. Um, two things about that comment is that what are you going to do if a blizzard is coming? We have blizzard plans, but there's not a lot you can do other than be prepared for enacting your blizzard plan, which in a lot of um, animal agriculture is, is not enough to just save all of the animals. And so the second part of that is typically we don't have our wind drop off like it did. Um, Southwest Kansas is home to some really, really wonderful wind gusts, and we don't typically miss out on that. And when the wind drops, we have what we refer to as a heat index crisis. And um, cattle can, in general, dissipate heat and, and acclimate to heat very well. Our, our perfect storm during this issue was the fact that we were re receiving such cool weather and then this sudden change on June 11th. Um, the heat index crisis would have began that night because the, it didn't cool off that night. Um, so the cattle could not get rid of their heat load overnight like they typically can when we do cool off. So the morning of June 12th is really when the disaster started, and that's when most of our feed yard employees um, would have gone out and seen a lot of dead cattle. Um, the majority of the death loss occurred on June 12th, but it didn't just end that day. We, we had several days of death loss following the 12th. The other part of the story that people miss out on is the lack of context that would have helped um, people within animal agriculture and people with no knowledge of animal agriculture um, to be faced with the, the fact that this weather event occurred centered in Haskell and Grant County in Southwest Kansas. Just to give you an idea, Haskell County is my home county. It's not where I live currently, but it's where I grew up. Um, and so my family farms and ranches in Haskell County, so I'm very familiar with that area. Uh, the ratio of cattle to people in Haskell County, Kansas is upwards of 107 to one. So there are a lot of cattle. Um, in Haskell and Grant County, there's over 600,000 head of cattle. Uh, the majority of those being cattle on feed at feed yards. And so cattle at the highest risk for a heat index crisis um, because they are carrying fat cover, they are carrying um, more weight than cattle that might be on pasture or might be on a stalker situation in other parts of the state. 25% um, of the nation's cattle are slaughtered within one hour of these counties. And so you can really get a good feeling for not only did this crisis happen in the most ino inopportune way, it happened in the most inopportune counties. Um, and that is really the context that needed shared that's very difficult for agriculture to, to come out and share right away um, because we might understand that and have a really good feel for that. Um, but our, our consumers and our people um, that are reacting to these stories just don't have that background. So on June 12th was the first day that I would have seen the video that many of you might have been, um, might have also seen. June 12th was when I got texted a video. It was really grainy. It looked like it was taken um, from a, you know, definitely not an iPhone, <laughs> um, but I know what yard it was taken at, and I know that it had to have been an employee of that yard, potentially um, in a loader or a feed truck. It, the height of the video, you can tell, is somebody that belonged on the yard. It wasn't anybody who snuck onto a feed yard and got that video footage. Um, I got texted that from an employee just asking questions. They wanted to know what the heck was going on. They were at a different feed yard um, in a different county that wasn't affected by the heat index crisis that we were dealing with in Haskell and Grant County, a little bit in Finney County, but mostly centered in those two counties. I got that video and I just quickly responded to that person, please don't share this, um, but this is what's going on. We know that this was heat stress. We know that we know that without a doubt, because there are live cattle in this situation. There are cattle um, that are 
presenting us with clinical signs of heat stress. There are cattle that follow all of the typical um, signs of heat stress that our risk assessment would, would put them in. So the cattle that are late days on feed, the cattle that are black kited, the cattle um, that are really close to slaughter. When I say late days on feed, that's what I mean by that. And so when we get to seeing the whole picture of the live cattle and the dead cattle and, and, and the weather event that happened, we know exactly what's going on. There was no question in our mind what we were dealing with. Um, and so I responded to that person, please don't share that. There's no context with it. There's literally just dead cattle that are being counted, um, accounted for in their software to make sure uh, that we have our deads accounted for and they, and we know where they came from and who, who needs to be notified of that. And that video um, was then taken. So I'm very confident it came from within our industry. And then it was taken, um, the account it was shared on on TikTok, it was not within our industry at that point. And there was a narrative put with it, um, definitely some words uh, placed on the video that were not accurate uh, description of what was going on in Kansas. And so I saw this video go at that point on June 12th, it had not gone viral. Um, and then I will frankly admit, I don't know the timeline after that. It might've been a mixture of the stress from work. Um, it might've had something to do with not sleeping because I had a newborn. It, it, you know, there was a lot going on um, in the days that come, but at some point that went viral and got very out of control. Um, and my brother called me uh, one of these days after that, and he's a farmer. And in June in Kansas, we're cutting wheat. And he was on his combine and he said, the heck is going on at, at Cattle Empire? Um, they are calling for volunteer firefighters to bring water. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, he is local. He is in agriculture. His sister is the veterinarian at this feed yard. He hauls a lot of corn to this feed yard um, and he didn't know what had happened. And so I decided to author a Facebook post in response to what was going on um, from a local standpoint, because I knew we'd have a lot of questions for my, my local people um, just in the community, maybe not directly involved in agriculture. So like any good communications trained person, um, I'm a veterinarian, I'm not a communications expert. I wrote this post in the middle of the night between feeding a baby at some point, and I sat on it. I wanted to think about it, wanted to make sure that it was well written, it conveyed what I wanted it to convey. Um, I attached a photo to it, and then I actually scheduled it to post, and the next morning, um, I had a doctor's appointment for my infant. We go into the doctor's office. I forgot that that post actually was going to happen, and I had no expectation that it would go viral. And so we go into the doctor's office. I left my phone in my vehicle. When I get out of the doctor's office, I had like 37 missed calls, 100 and some uh, Facebook messages and comments and, and things like that. And then um, several voicemails from like one from a senator, one from a, a news outlet from Wichita, Kansas. I had just things had really hit the fan and I had not expected that to happen. Um, and I'm glad that I filled a void of communication that obviously people were wanting um, people within agriculture and people just close to agriculture really shared that post that got a lot of traction um, right away because they wanted the misinformation to go away as all as well because they knew what was going on or they just they didn't know what was going on and they wanted to share that information with their following. Um, the post that I made had over 13,000 shares I lost count of the comments and I refused to go back and look and find out how many comments, but um, comments that would definitely keep you up at night. Um, either, I, I don't allow anybody to have the power to offend me uh, in, the, in the comments on my post, um, but some of them would keep you up at night for the dark places people go um, when, 
when they're coming up with their reasoning as to why this happened. Uh, I believe our biggest issue with this from an animal agriculture standpoint was the lack of context that that video, the original video got. Um, and I was trying to provide that context in my Facebook response without just coming out and saying, hey, we're going to have less than 2% death loss in the feed yard after this really terrible event. I think we actually did a really good job. That doesn't bode well with our consumer or people who are already on that uh, conspiracy theory train. And so we have to um, combat that with, with a little bit softer messaging, I've uh, figured out. But that lack of context really led people um, to this space of conspiracy theory development. Um, and whether it was water or air or feed related, terrorism related, um, government, my gosh, people really, really don't trust our government because they really thought that they came out to Haskell and Grant County, Kansas and, and did this and that this would have a huge effect on our food supply. And, and we all know within the industry that that's just so far from true. It's not even funny. Um, we had an event like this happen in 2010. At that time, I was beginning my veterinary school career and it happened in Great Bend, Kansas, um, an area that's much more uh, humid than Southwest Kansas, but it's home to a lot of feeder cattle um, and a lot of really high quality cattle. So the context is there as well. There's a lot more black kited cattle in the Great Bend feeding area um, and just, it was very concentrated area that had a heat index crisis very similar to what we were dealing with. Recent rain event, high temperature, high humidity, wind stops, and, and that they had a disaster. In 2010, Facebook definitely existed. Social media existed, I'll admit that, but um, barely, right? There was just not the sharing capability. Uh, content wasn't shared as often as it is now. Um, TikTok definitely didn't uh, hit the scenes by then. And, and content wasn't shared like it is today in a way that would get so much traction. And so in 2010, they lost about 2% of the cattle on feed in that Great Bend area, and nobody even heard about it. I, I have veterinarians within my uh, friend group that haven't heard about that. Um, and so I have studied it because I'm in the feed yard business and, and I work with feed yards uh, on a regular basis. And I've studied it for the lessons learned on heat abatement practices and what we can do to improve um, feedlot management when we're dealing with these heat um, stress incidences. But there's a lot of colleagues of mine in, in the veterinary profession who had no idea that that happened in 2010. And that just goes to show us kind of a slap in the face on, on not very long ago, um, an event that was very similar in numbers and severity got zero traction because nobody shared a video. Um, nobody took this up. Somebody probably took a cell phone video, um, but nobody put it on TikTok. Some of the lessons learned, I wanted to spend the majority of my time on this paradigm um, talking about some of the lessons learned from communicating um, through tragedy, communicating through something that just really hits your profession and um, really just kind of rocks your world. And, and it, it rocked all of our worlds because it was instant, it was severe, and there was so much misunderstanding around what was happening. But it rocked our world because what we had to do out on the feed yard was very labor intensive uh, suddenly. And I talk about that a lot, that what we do on the feed yard on a good day is really hard work. Um, and so through something like this, when the temperatures, they didn't just shut off, it was still 105 plus degrees for many days. Um, the cattle were still stressed, even once we got the death loss under control and we got things uh, looking up, they were still stressed and compromised. Um, and so we just, um, that was a big eye opener for me, is the people, when we looked around and our, our industry needed to start communicated, communicating and needed to start connecting with consumers so that we could um, combat this TikTok viral video, 
with good information from people with their boots on the ground, we were really busy. We were really stressed out. We were really emotional. Um, and that was really hard for me to grapple with in the beginning because I thought to myself, you know, somebody else needs to take this torch. Somebody else needs to, to be dealing with this because we're busy. Um, but the people who have the most credibility in that moment are the ones with the boots on the ground. Um, I called one of my good friends and, and feed yard owners. Um, many of you probably followed her throughout the um, event as well, Trista Brown, priest at Cattle Empire. And I called her and I said, if we don't start talking, somebody else is telling this story and we don't want that story told. We want what is actually happening and what we're doing about it to be told. And so that was the number one challenge is the people who need and have the most credibility are the only ones um, talking in that moment. And, and we need to be able to support them as an industry. We need to, to figure out a way to deploy communications um, expertise across uh, all, all parts of animal agriculture. You know, our, our brothers and sisters in poultry, in pork, they, they deal with this um, a lot as well. We might have situations where they are so busy, they can't handle it they can't be the communicators, but they need to be. And so we just need to, to remember that and support them in that. Another communication challenge that I came across that I really wasn't expecting, um, but now in hindsight makes a lot of sense, is that within the agriculture community itself, we had a lot of misinformation um, and issues with facts being shared. Um, at first, I was really struggling with that. People that are well respected have huge followings, um, have, you know, my deepest respect, might be sharing things in a way that they, they were not factual as well. And I think that's like kind of a gut punch as well for agriculturalists to take and say, hey, I may not understand the feed yard industry. I may raise a lot of cattle. I may do this, um, I may have an, a dairy, I may have a big poultry barn, but I don't understand how a feed yard works or I don't understand what they're up against. Um, and it's okay to say that and still share with your following what we're dealing with um, in a way that presents facts as, true as, as truly as they can be presented. Um, and so I know within the agriculture community, there was even some conspiracy theories coming out um, from people about different weather patterns and different um, possibilities of water, uh, feed con contamination, things like that. And those were things that were pretty frustrating in the days following because I was thinking to myself, we're dealing with, with people who have very little knowledge for the most, um, most, most of the people following, um, we're dealing with people who have very little knowledge of the feed yard industry. And then you take this subset of agriculturalists who do have a pretty good idea, but just don't understand some of the context or intricacies of what we are dealing with. And most of that stems back to not understanding how many cattle are on feed in this area. Um, and just understanding that death loss would be under 2%. Um, we, were, we were thinking if we kept it under 2%, we'd be pretty happy with, with the efforts that we put forward in those days to come. And a lot of these yards did stay under 2%. There was a couple yards that went over, um, but as a whole, we were able um, to use our heat abatement plans and, and keep that. And under 2% after a major weather event is, is something as a veterinarian that I'm, I'm very happy with. Um, again, I don't want that to be uh, taken. I don't want any loss of animal life to be taken lightly. And as agriculturalists, we all know that it's hard to lose animals. Um, one, one number is hard to lose, um, but I deal in percentages and context and, and evaluating data every day. And so that was the biggest issue was the fact that that hardly anybody outside of agriculture understood that, but 
there were even a lot of people within on our same team that didn't understand that maybe. And then I think the second um, biggest thing to communicate through that I struggled with and, and I will wholeheartedly admit I maybe didn't do a great job of, um, but something that we need to bring to light and figure out as a community how to combat this and, and, and how to communicate it better, but carcass disposal. Um, carcass disposal is not a topic that's easily covered anywhere, right? We, we struggle with that um, on good days, <laughs> and we're really going to struggle with it on a bad day. Um, carcass disposal in itself is an issue for animal agriculture because um, whether we're burying, rendering, uh, composting, whatever our option is, a lot of times when we get hit with percentages of cattle that overwhelm any of those systems, we, we have an emergency carcass disposal issue. Uh, rendering is going to be a big topic in animal agriculture in the next decade. It, it's got to be figured out and it's got to be a challenge that we overcome. Regulation of carcass disposal is going to be something that we need to pay more attention to, in my opinion. Um, we aren't a, the best time to research um, whether we can compost 3,500 head of cattle or, or 500 head of cattle, the best time to do that is in an emergency situation. And we don't have the right to employ that because our emergency carcass disposal in for a lot of my yards is burial. Um, and so we don't have the option to employ new things because we are regulated. And so we maybe need to look at uh, different regulatory avenues that we can explore um, so that the next time something like this happens, we have the right to look into a different carcass disposal method that's safe for the environment that that accomplishes what we need to accomplish. Um, but the the only time you can research that is when when something really bad happens, and we usually don't have time to um, employ those actions at that point. The other issue with carcass disposal um, that I'll bring up is it's expensive to dispose of carcasses anyways, um, but in an emergency basis, it, it was really expensive to um, figure out the carcass disposal. Landfills didn't take those carcasses for free. Um, that cost, that had a cost for the feed yard industry. Um, and then burial obviously isn't free. We don't, we don't own those payloaders on a regular basis. And so we definitely had um, extra expense in fuel and machinery, rental costs, things like that, labor um, that we had to employ during those periods of time. And those kinds of things aren't always um, thought about when you're, when you're looking at support, um, either government funded or, you know, however it works. Um, a lot of our feed yards aren't, aren't able to account for all of that and it was expensive. Um, and then I think finally, I would just leave, uh, I wanna come back to the fact that the most relatable people are usually the ones with the boots on the ground. So we have this um, thought when there's a disaster in agriculture, there's this feeling that we could um, just, pick up pick up the pieces and the veterinarians that are on the front lines or or the employees that are on the front lines um, can also carry the communication torch and that is just not the case um, the most relatable people in in the event of a disaster are often the most busy people and so we need to understand that respect that and figure out how to support that in the best way possible because um, there are a lot of feed yard veterinarians. There were a lot of feed yards affected um, and not very many of them picked up the communication torch either because they weren't comfortable or they didn't feel supported or they didn't, um, that's just not their forte, right? They're, we run into that in agriculture um, all the time is, is not all of us are meant to be communicators of of these hard topics and not all of us are 
willing to do it or able to do it. And so um, that's just one of my challenges moving forward is, is that we can, we can do better and we can improve on that. Um, and it's going to take a team of us to figure that out. But with that, I think I'll open it up to questions if anybody has questions at this point in the session. That way we can um, touch on touch on things that you guys might be more interested in because I know some of you might ha have had a lot of background in the actual crisis or or more of an interest in the communication piece of it. And so I wanted to leave plenty of time for us to kind of discuss all of those things. If anybody wants to raise their hand or unmute themselves, we can take those questions any way you'd like to give them. While we're waiting for some of those to filter in, uh, I've been in digital communications for a few years now, and I know that there are trolls when it comes to especially difficult conversations, but just agriculture statements in general will, will generate a few tro trolls. How did you deal with those? Did you get any? What kind of messages did you get? And is it so overwhelming that you're not really willing to put yourself out there again? Um, I would say... I hate to come back to um, that newborn life that I was living at that. Well, what am I kidding? He's still a newborn. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to come back to that, um, but I'll, I'll be really honest. I was a hormone casserole those days. <laughs> it was a mess. Um, and so you really, uh, you really have to harden yourself and realize that the same people coming up with the ridiculous response to what you're living are making some of those really harsh con comments. And so I just had to just shut it off. Um, it wasn't worth responding to everyone that had a negative comment. There were so many comments about, you know, she didn't even go to veterinary school. I Googled her and um, Morgan and I were discussing this like on I like Google my name. It, it says I'm a veterinarian on Google a couple of times. So um, it's not like we found that, you know, we found this random person who's barely a veterinarian um, or in veterinary school or small animal veterinarian, you know, a, a feedlot veterinarian who grew up and lives currently in Kansas um, stood up and spoke out. And that's what I was losing my mind about is like, how much more credible <laughs> they want us to be. <laughs> um, some of the comments of the conspiracy, I really just try to co combat with a, a place of understanding. Our, our country and our world is a, at a really unsettled place, you know, post-pandemic. Um, there's, there's war in many parts of the world right now. There's just a really unsettled feeling in general. Um, and so I just tried to hit a lot of the conspiracy with, with a point of understanding, because I think if you came at people, or at least I felt like this was correct. If you came at people with, you're crazy, that's, let's not relating with them. But if I came at them with more of, I understand how you got there. I understand why you don't trust anybody. Um, because there's days I don't trust anybody, but listen to me on why you should trust someone. Um, and that was really helpful to just come at them um, with a little bit more understanding than I maybe wanted to rely on, because I really wanted to tell people like, hey, if somebody was dismantling uh, our food supply, I think they'd do a way better job because this isn't <laughs> going to do much. Um, and so it was just... Uh, interesting to hit a lot of those comments. Um, some of my family, I love them. I come from wonderful people and um, I really want uh, to not take away from their support, but man, I've got some big sisters that I wouldn't mess with. Um, <laughs> and you, you almost have to tell your family, like, be prepared. This is going to get ugly in the comments and you don't need to take it personally for me because I'm not taking it personally. <laughs> um, and then I think just, yeah, just being able to combat that with like walking away when you don't need to, to respond. Um, Cause there's, 
there's like 80% of the comments that aren't worth responding to. <laughs> and then um, just realizing what you need to let roll off your back. And then one thing that our industry did a phenomenal job of, I will like never forget some of the text messages that I got in the days um, following my post. And, you know, when I was dealing with a lot of the communications efforts after that, were, you know, some of my treasure, my most treasured text messages that I'll keep in my mind or emails that I'll keep in my mind, people just reaching out and saying, hey, we're, we're, we're here for you. We support you. Um, and we, we think you're doing a great job. I will never forget that because I've never been that person who would have sent that text message when a friend or colleague of mine was facing something really, really difficult and then chose to take a very public stance on it and and then get the backlash that they were. Um, some, some of the colleagues that offered support, um, whether it was a Facebook comment or a, or a direct message or anything like that, um, those kind of keep you going because you're like, hey, I'm doing something for the industry. Or I'd have somebody um, who, I, I got really nervous about some of the feed yard backlash because feed yards tend to be pretty, pretty private. We, you know, we're cattlemen. We don't, we don't really um, get out there and put ourselves out there. And some of the people within the feed feedlot industry who reached out and said, Hey, thanks for doing this. Cause I would have never been that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that support really meant a lot. Cause I was afraid I was telling a story that they didn't want to be, that they didn't want have told. Um, and I was telling that story because somebody else was going to tell exactly what they thought was going on. And so it was, it was my opinion that if we didn't get a hold of it, um, we would, we would fall behind the eight ball. And so it was almost sharing a story without permission from everybody involved, right? Because there are customers of the cattle, there are people who raise the cattle, there's, um, the employees who work here. Um, there's, you know, many facets of the industry that, um, are involved and I was afraid without knowing that that there was support coming from within the industry I was afraid maybe there would be a lot of people who said hey I didn't want that story told um and I I kind of took that upon myself and and felt like it needed to be told anyways but there was a lot of support within the lines of craziness and so I do want to um give credit where that is due because um I will change how I respond in the future when when a colleague from from animal agriculture is going through something tough and communicating through it with the public um you know maybe just a simple text message saying I think you're doing a great job if I can do anything let me know um could really carry them through some really ugly comments because those ugly comments come all all times of the day and night <laughs> <laughs> they sure do um what is it trolls never sleep right <laughs> i don't know so uh mothers of newborns don't sleep it, it, that's fair sleep. that's fair and trolls definitely don't sleep <laughs> We have a couple of really good questions that have come in. Ryan Goodman asked, what response from industry organizations would have helped most to support you in your responses and engagement in the conversations following the event? I think um, knowing that this was a heat index crisis and there was not that much um, complexity or science to communicate, I think that a lot of communication could have been taking, like, I don't know that you needed a, a credibility of a veterinarian. Um, I do, I do think that helps to some extent. We know that consumers really relate with, with veterinarians. They, I mean, they ask for it every day when they uh, tune into all the shows on, on Discovery Channel that are starring a veterinarian. And so I don't know that this was a, a pretty simple topic. It wasn't scientifically complex. Um, I think we need a little bit more support on what are the things that I would really hit on and what are the things that you don't need to talk about in depth. Um, because you want to talk about a person who doesn't understand how to not overanalyze the topic, that's a veterinarian. Hello. <laughs> overanalyze things for a living. And so um, that was difficult for me is like, how deep do you get into this? Um, 
how how complex do I describe the veteran or the the feedlot industry in these counties so that people have enough context, but maybe you know just enough to to suffice that hunger um, for information, and that I think would be helpful coming from. Um, the communications experts in within our industry organizations, because um, I'm definitely going to overanalyze it and not come up with the right answer. And, and the people trained in communication and 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 more experienced in the communication uh, space would would have those answers for me. And maybe even just uh, sending quick uh, talking notes or you know, hey, you're not going to offend someone who's dealing with a crisis at work, dealing with um, a communications uh, event through crisis, you're not going to offend them if you send an email that says, hey, this, these are my thoughts. Um, and in my mind, if they do get offended, then whatever, they probably did, wouldn't read into it too much. Um, so I do think that would be one way of supporting it because um, a lot of times the people with credibility may be uh, like myself, I, I really spend a lot of time trying to choose the right words and trying to figure out what to say um, because I didn't want to come off as a 2% death loss doesn't matter to me because it matters. It matters a lot. Um, but it also showed me that a lot of our heat abatement was working um, and it was hard to convey that in a way that people um, would be satisfied, I guess. That makes sense. So the next the next question is, do you have thoughts on written messaging, whether it's Facebook or emails when it just moved <laughs> uh, versus oral phone call, live video interview or podcast and the difference audiences reached and also the risk, which this is a really good question because Tara talked about her post that went viral, but she also did a Facebook live. You worked with an agriculture influencer and didn't, wasn't that an Instagram live where you, you fielded mm -hmm. some questions. So you, you did put yourself out there in a few different ways. Yeah. So I would say the live videos and, um, all of the, the video type footage is almost easier. Um, I think we can all appreciate that it's easier to connect with people in person, you know, after we've all been thrown on Zoom and we're obviously um, able to do this on Zoom, um, which gives us a lot of good uh, opportunities. But I think that that video aspect of it was easier to connect with people. It was easier to come on and and show your emotion um, and, and not in a, we're acting like this is emotional. It was, I, I'll never forget, you know, working with Trista at Cattle Empire, um, one of her Instagram stories, I mean, she got visibly shaken and, and choked up. And I sent her a text. And I said, A, I hope you're doing okay. And B, that was a great thing to share today. Um, because it would have been really easy for her to push discard on that and not post it um, as a, as a, point of pride, you know, and, right. and she didn't. And I told her that that was really necessary. So I think we can't forget like the video and the lives um, are really helpful. Podcasts are great. You can get a lot of good conversation moving on them. Um, I really, really struggled with uh, any sort of media interaction um, for writing an article. Um, that was really tough to keep the topic of the article on the topic versus what the author wanted that topic to be. And so one of the examples I'll use is a um, journalist who really, really wanted me to admit that this was all due to climate change. Um, and it, it took multiple, multiple questions and me avoiding the questions and me repeating the fact that I'm not a climate expert, nor do I want to pose as one, nor do I want to come off as commenting anything about the weather in general, other than I know what the weather does to cattle. Um, and so that was really difficult to get them back to the actual topic. Um, and I understand they have their goals for their readership and they have their goals um, for their editors and what they want to get published. Um, but it, that was the hardest place for me to control the narrative and keep it 
um, positive and keep it to where it was actually factual. Um, because for a written article, A, I, I'm always really nervous that they'll actually allow you to review it before publishing. Um, and then B, they can really control that conversation and get you swayed the other direction where like a live, um, a live video or a podcast, you have a lot more control because you can just move on or, or switch um, gears and there's a lot of pivoting that you can do. And so that, um, that was probably one of the biggest challenges is when they were trying to uh, contact me about a written piece. I almost want to stop um, answering those. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next question comes from Warren Hess. Has there been any, any discussion since the event about benefits of developing pre-scripted messaging for the various potential events that may impact the industry, which this is right on lines with crisis communications, which I think there's a few experts on the phone that have dealt with that before. And Tara, you talked about it a little bit before, but if you can share with the group. I think um, as far as a response, um, I know and have a lot of faith that there will be um, some good response from our crisis communications experts within the industry on, on developing good talking points around heat stress, heat events, things like that. Um, the industry itself is going to have to take a pretty hard look at what we do for heat abatement in the United States, you know, we have some competitive um, international trade uh, competition that, that they raise cattle under shade all the time. Um, and cattle that are allowed shade or, uh, or raised indoor or um, any of those answers, I don't have the answer for that either. And I don't think the answer is as simple as going out there and building shades in every one of my pens. Um, the cattle behavior during this um, event was very interesting for me to study, and I don't know that shades are the answer. I still think we need to research that because I'm afraid the cattle would have bunched underneath the shade, um, and then we still would have had significant losses. Um, I'm not going to claim to know uh, the cost-benefit analysis of shades right now for every one of my feed yards. Um, but I know a lot of feed yards who have who have ran those numbers, and there's a reason there's not shades on 100% of the cattle um, raised for for beef in the United States. There's a, there's a reason that doesn't exist yet, right? Because the ROI is not as simple as shade costs this much, and we're going to get this much return on it. Um, and so the behavior of the animals um, was peculiar in the fact that I didn't mention that earlier, it was peculiar in the fact that we really worry about water consumption. We have adequate water consumption on a daily basis normally, um, but when those cattle get to where um, their behavior is changed because they're stressed, we had the um, socially strong animals hoarding the space around the water tank and drinking um, all the water, and then we just had animals who were too weak to fight through that barrier and, and they were dying of thirst. Um, so it was not just heat stress or heat stroke that caused death. We did have animals die of lack of water. Um, and that's why in a heat abatement plan, we had so many water tanks out. That would be a topic that would be very difficult for me to have brought up like, oh, hey, we also saw these animals literally dying of thirst. Um, but that was a behavior thing that, that we don't typically see in the feed yard. And it was something that um, really woke us up to our heat abatement plans need to include extra water tanks earlier in the process. You know, we always thought um, we would offer the water tanks for uh, convection cooling for them to stand around the water and get cooler. But some of it is we just need to get them water. Um, because of the behavioral aspect. And so some of those uh, um, scripted messaging would be helpful to keep a veterinarian like myself from overanalyzing all of the facts that we're getting um, at the time and the research that's gonna need to be done. You know, I was taking notes every day to try to figure out what I could do better for my clients when this happens inevitably again. Um, and so I think, I do think uh, the industry is gonna have 
from a communication standpoint and a scientific standpoint, uh, a lot of work being focused on heat stress and, and heat abatement and what we do about it. Because uh, fortunately for beef consumers, we've gone to a really high quality, um, genetically driven black hided product, right? And with that comes more heat. Um, they eat more and their, their hides are black. Um, and we saw that. The, TikTok video did not show very many yellow or red animals dead in that pile. Our dead piles did not have very many yellow or red um, animals in them. And so that consumer driven uh, focus on quality, we have responded with good genetics and with those genetics comes some issues and this is a big one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right, as we wrap this up, if anybody has additional questions, please send them in so we can make sure to get to them. Uh, Dr. Lu Lucas Pantaleon ha has been to a mortality management and complexity uh, conference. If anybody has any questions about that, he would be wonderful to talk to. And he's posted a link to the, the event earlier this summer. And uh, Jane Dukes is from Merck Animal Health and she is, has a history and in uh, crisis communications for, you know, whether it's working in communications in general or working for McDonald's, she has handled a lot and highly recommends having a preparedness plan uh, for when things go wrong. Uh, the next question is not strictly communication related, but in most disasters, governors can declare a state of emergency, which may clear some of the regulatory hurdles regarding carcass disposal. Did this occur? That would probably be a great question for you, Tara, where you've done a lot of research with, with you know, things that have happened when it comes to whether it's disposal or what can be done in crisis. If you can answer that, that'd be awesome. So almost all of our, um, almost all of my clients have an emergency carcass disposal plan. Um, and it actually has to be uh, approved by the state and it does allow us to um, change a lot of the ways we typically uh, deal with carcasses. And so rendering in our area is, is by far and away the most common uh, portal for us to get rid of carcasses. Um, and the next most common is burial. And so most of my clients have plans in place and the state has to approve those plans. And then we have to call in to the state um, as soon as reasonably possible. Um, and so that Sunday we would have called in to try to get our emergency burial um, site opened up and, and ready for carcass disposal. The, the big thing on that is, is I would really like to see composting um, be more readily uh, researched and available and, and an option, because I do think at that point, um, we have a really usable product that we have no value in if we put it into our landfill and put it into these um, burial sites. And I do think composting at that point, um, if we could do some large scale studies on how long it would take to get rid of, um, to compost these animals, um, we would likely have a really sought after product to sell then as fertilizer um, for area crop ground. And so that was the main thing I would have liked to do. And, and it was not allowed at that point um, based on our emergency uh, disposal plans. Um, but I would have liked to see if we could compost because also the temperatures were 105 for a long time and we were looking at it being the beginning of the summer, we probably could have composted a lot of those carcasses very successfully um, and, and measured that, but it we had to follow what, what our emergency plan was and that was burial um, either by landfill or um, on the land that, that we had previously identified. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Barnhart. You've been a wealth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And thank you for everybody attending. If anybody would like to follow up with Dr. Tara, you can email, you can just reply to some of the reminder emails that you got today and I will connect you. And if you have any questions for me, I can help you out there as well. So thanks everyone for attending and we'll see you next time. Thank you for having me.